Hello and welcome to Free For All Friday. I'm your host, Chip Griffin, and we'll be talking about lots of things related to agency leadership today. We're going to work through a few different topics that have come up in the news over the last few days, as well as some conversations that I've had with some of my coaching clients and other agency owners. So with that, let's dig right into the news of the week. And we're going to start with a survey from PR Week. And PR Week took a look at um, what's going on in the PR space right now. And there obviously has been a lot of disruption, uh, both in agencies and brand side. And the, the PR Week uh, budget or survey looked in particular at budgets and some of the things that have been done as far as businesses uh, cutting back and making changes uh, and shifting what it is that they're doing. And so uh, on the client side, about two thirds of them have been cutting budgets. That's no surprise. Most of the agencies that I'm talking to have been seeing that sort of activity. Um, uh, a significant number have therefore cut the retainers of their uh, agencies. So I think about 77%, if I recall correctly, uh, from the PR Week story. Uh, indicated that they were uh, paying their agencies less now than they had before the crisis began. 90% of them have postponed campaigns. 83% have canceled activities. So we're, we're seeing clearly a lot of disruption. Um, and if we look on the agency side of things, uh, you know, they're really feeling the pain. So, uh, and many of you out there, I'm sure, are seeing the same thing. You're seeing your revenues going down, and so you're feeling pressure to cut your own expenses. I know a lot of the agencies that I'm working with are trying to figure out how to, to rejigger things. Um, obviously, in uh, the United States, we have PPP, and in other countries, there are other support measures in place to try to help agencies weather the storm without... Um, laying off uh, employees and that sort of thing. So, you know, there's there's clearly work being done to try to improve um, what's happening. But um, despite that, we are starting to see some layoffs, and we'll talk more about that um, soon. I, I think uh, the PR Week story indicated that in their survey, about one out of five agencies have begun to lay off employees. We've started to see some big names in agencies, both uh, on the PR side, marketing, uh, advertising, um, shedding staff. And that's understandable. If you're in a business that has lost 10, 20, 30% or more of your revenue, it's very difficult to maintain your headcount, even with the various government support measures. And I've generally been advising agencies that are taking this funding to try to find ways to uh, use that as a bridge to to allow their staff reductions to give their teams a softer landing. And it's tough because, you know, nobody from a human standpoint wants to let people go, particularly amid what's going on right now. This is not something where it is the fault of any individual or business. It is an external um, act of God, if you will, that is causing this problem. And so it's very difficult to operate. But we all want to try to do the best that we can for our teammates, our employees. Uh, we know that they've got families, that they've got struggles, and, and so we want to try to do the best we can. But at the same time, if we're running a business and we're seeing sharp uh, disruption to our revenue, sharp reductions in our cash flow, we need to be looking at making some changes so that we can maintain the overall health of the business. Otherwise, we're in a position where we're protecting a small number of people today or a smaller number of people today from being laid off, but potentially putting the whole business and therefore the jobs of all team members at risk. So it is a very difficult and delicate balancing act, but we are starting to see some of that realization uh, take place that this is, this is here for the long term. This crisis is not something that we're just going to flip a switch and return to the, the good old days uh, in a short period of time. It's it's going to be a slow ramp up. We're going to see brands, I think, continue to be uh, cautious in their spending. And so that means that we need to be cautious in our own spending in the agency world. And as we, you know, look through um, the, the PR Week survey, you know, they look at a number of different issues beyond just the, the revenue and layoff uh, projections. They look at, for example, 
um, you know, how many folks have had employees or family members impacted by COVID. And, and I'll include a link to this in the uh, the after notes to this, but um, you know you can go over to the prweek.com website and, and take a look for yourself. There clearly are a number of agencies that are seeing impacts to their teams, uh, but uh, you know the vast majority here, none of the above, is is the answer that we're seeing for most of them. Um, so it, it's it's clearly something that is impacting, but it is not uh, an overwhelming impact on uh, most agencies from a health perspective. Budget, whole different story. Uh, you're seeing that, you know, 90 something percent have seen their revenue steady or declining, um, and only a very small number of agencies are seeing any revenue uptick. Most of those uh, that I'm seeing tend to be in the crisis space and some in the digital space as well, particularly as businesses are having to undergo a forced and rapid digital transformation, whether you're talking about the education sector, um, whether you're talking about restaurants who have had to transition to online ordering, if they're going to stay open at all. There's a lot of uh, activity in the digital space in addition to crisis. And of course, anyone who is focused on the healthcare space is probably seeing at least uh, a steady relationship with their clients or perhaps increasing. And I, I should say that, that would be healthcare that's impacted by COVID in a, uh, in, in a making them busier kind of way. We are starting to see, from what I understand, uh, some hospitals, medical practices, and those sorts of things that are not directly impacted by COVID. In other words, they're not taking on COVID patients. They're actually seeing decreases. So, you know, whether that's people, uh, doctors who are doing elective surgeries, whether that's hospitals that, uh, you know, simply are seeing a reduction in the number of individuals coming in for standard health complaints that they might otherwise come in for. There's actually pressure there. So some of those businesses, some of those hospitals and medical practices are having to cut back on their agency work as well. But um, obviously there is a segment of the healthcare community that is extra busy right now. And so that is leading to some extra work for agencies. Um, so, you know, overall, I would say it's a, it, it's a fairly negative picture um, when you look at the PR week uh, results. And that's not surprising. It's, it, it, there have been a lot of surveys coming out um, that have been showing that most agencies are feeling some sort of a negative impact. Um, certainly, even for those agencies that are holding steady, it's impacting their ability to grow because new business tends to be on hold. Um, there has been, there was an article, I think it was in Ad Week uh, this week, that talked about how, you know, some RFPs in the advertising space are starting to come back, but it's, a, it's still a relatively limited number. And, and most of what I'm seeing with my own clients and other agencies that I'm talking with is that the business that they are closing right now tends to be business that was already in the pipeline before all of this started happening. Um, there's very little in the way of new activity, new contacts that have been made in the last couple of months that's actually moving to the, the closing stage. Um, that said, there is a lot of uh, a lot of good conversations are taking place around new business right now, so I'm certainly encouraging all agency owners to be very active in talking to their networks, talking to their prospects, and continuing to create the conditions for future success because it you really need to be laying that groundwork right now. So, um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, before we do, though, a little bit more on the, the bad news side. We've seen uh, a number of big name agencies have uh, started to, to make some layoffs. Uh, Golan, Weber, Shanwick, Publicis, VaynerMedia, uh, you know, uh, sort of a uh, a, a healthy mix of the who's who in the large agency space have started to reduce headcount. Um, some by relatively small numbers. I think uh, Golan was a couple of dozen employees out of, uh, I don't know, I, I think they have about 1,800 employees worldwide, uh, if I remember correctly. And so it's, it, it is something that is happening. It is, I think we're going to see more of it. I think that there has been um, an artificial deflation in the number of layoffs in the agency space and frankly in other businesses as folks have relied on some of these government supports, PPP, et cetera, in order to um, hold off on, on making those difficult choices. But I really do think that the pressure is starting to build and the, you know, the horizon is looking further off for returning to 
uh, the same revenue levels that most agencies had been at or have been on a trajectory for um, in the first quarter of this year. So uh, I would expect that we will see in uh, June and into July an increasing number of layoffs from agencies. So um, it's certainly something to, to keep an eye on. Uh, and as we take a look at you know some of the, the lessons learned out of this, Art Stevens, who is very active in the agency M&A space and has been for a long time, uh, he writes regularly for O'Dwyer's, and, and he talked about some of the lessons that he was seeing out of this and some of the things that he thought that um, agencies should be focused on um, as they're moving through um, this particular time. And so he was talking about things like uh, having a line of credit lined up. Obviously, if you don't have a line of credit right now, you're unlikely to be getting one anytime soon. So, you know, but as as your business stabilizes, it is helpful to have a line of credit so that you can cushion cash flow when needed. It is important, though, to understand that um, your uh, any line of credit, any debt should be used simply to smooth over cash flow when you have known income coming in. So you've just got slow paying clients or something like that. Um, I would not be using it to hold off on making tough decisions about layoffs and those kinds of things, because otherwise you're just digging yourself a deeper hole. Um, again, you know, Art talks about having cash on hand. Yeah, great idea, but that's for the future. It's not really going to help you today. It's certainly a valuable lesson for the future. Agencies that ran close to the line um, you know, are feeling the pinch in a more severe way. Um, the next point here is uh, encouraging transitions to virtual agencies, and I think this is a, a really interesting topic, and um, I, I think we'll have a, a separate uh, discussion um, in the future on this uh, because it's there's a lot of talk about the current situation driving more uh, businesses, more agencies to become virtual, and I think we certainly will see an increase in the amount of um, activity that we see as far as um, agencies becoming virtual, but I think we'll see it in more of a hybrid way. I don't think that we're likely to be seeing a scenario where um, the the predominant way that agencies operate is virtual. I think there are benefits to having um, offices and, and people in, together in teams, but I think what we're seeing through this crisis is that it is not as difficult to have employees work remotely as many agency owners thought. On the flip side, I think we're also seeing that it's not practical for everybody to work remotely. Even right now, with schools closed and the additional pressure that you're, you're seeing and, and the challenges that parents in particular are having, you see other areas where remote work isn't uh, a particularly good option for some people. So that may be younger workers who live with roommates. Um, often those folks don't have a dedicated work from home space. So that's that's challenging and, and that's unlikely to change in the near future for many of those folks. And so they're going to have to have some way to uh, participate in agency life in more of an office type environment when it becomes feasible to do so. Parents, even even when parents start to have kids going back to school and camp and daycare and that sort of thing, not everybody has full day access to these things. So if, if the kids are at home, even if they've got a babysitter or something like that, it's hard to keep a five, six, seven year old kid from, you know, running into mommy and daddy's office space. And so, you know, while that's something that we're all becoming accustomed to now, I don't think a lot of the parents want to be dealing with that necessarily on an ongoing basis. So there's going to be more of a hybrid model that I think we're going to be looking at in the future. But we certainly will continue to see um, more businesses, more agencies having that virtual component to it. Um, and so then as we continue on in, in some of the lessons that, that Art talks about, um, you know, one of the things that, that he and others have talked about are the importance of trying to lock clients into longer term contracts and not having 30, 60, 90 day outs. Um, this is actually something I, I disagree with pretty strongly. And, and I think actually the current crisis helps demonstrate why long term contracts aren't necessarily the, the right answer. And that's because a lot of agencies are finding out that their contracts really aren't worth the paper that they're printed on or the pixels that are on the screen because 
ultimately, if a client says, look, um, you know, I'm a restaurant, I've lost my business, I, I'm not going to be able to keep paying you, they're probably not even going to be able to abide by a 30 or 60 or 90 day out, let alone um, being locked into a long term contract. So I think that, that contracts are something that um, are worth using, but at the same time, they're their leverage in a conversation with a client who wants or needs to move on, they are not something that you should use as a cudgel to beat them with because that doesn't really help your long-term prospects in working with that client or the contacts of that client when they move on to other employers. So um, I, I think this is one of those areas where we need to take a little bit of a balanced look and understand um, how we can leverage contracts as part of the overall relationship but I'm not a big fan of, of using the contracts to lock in clients who are in difficult positions or are not feeling like they're getting the results that they need. So, um, you know, your mileage may vary, and, and obviously um, different folks are going to give you different advice here. But, um, you know, my advice is to, um, to not be too aggressive with the contracts and instead figure out um, how you can work with clients. Um, diversification, another thing that, that Art's talking about here, obviously diversification is a really important thing. We all talk about uh, niching down, and I'm a big fan in having your agency focus on particular uh, verticals and services. I'm not saying that you do all things for all people. That tends not to work very well, but you can still, even within a, a niche, you can diversify. You might have uh, a couple of semi-related niches. You might have, uh, you, you know, your diversification might just be to make sure you don't have a client concentration issue, that you don't have uh, clients that are so closely aligned in their ups and downs that it becomes problematic. Um, that said, what we're seeing right now is an environment unlike anything we've ever seen before. And so it, it's hard to diversify effectively to deal with a pandemic. Uh, where everybody is uh, locked in um, or, or at least restricted in their movements and so therefore it's having a far broader, far wider economic impact than the typical economic shock, the typical recession that one would see and one would plan for. So you certainly do want to try to do the best you can to avoid client concentration problems and focus on diversification of your clients, but um, you, you should not lose sight of the, the notion that you do want to become more of a specialist and less of a generalist um, uh, in who you're serving and, and the services that you're providing. Um, and then, uh, you know, Art's also talking about some of the things as far as employees go. Um, look, this is a particularly challenging time for employer-employee relations in all businesses, but particularly in agencies. Agencies are a human capital business. It is all about the people. We say it all the time. We mean it all the time. But the reality is that a lot of tough decisions have to be made here. And so, you know, as an agency owner, you need to try to be compassionate for the humans who work for you. But at the same time, you need to make smart decisions for your business. Um, Art's advocating that you have provisions in your agreements with employees that allow you to take some unilateral actions for the health of the business. A lot of this is going to depend on how you structure your employee arrangements, whether you have actual contracts or if you're in a state that, that permits um, at-will employment. So, you know, you know I, I, I would encourage you to look at your own individual circumstances, but certainly you do need to have flexibility and you do need to make the decisions that are right um, for your business. Uh, and then finally, Art talks about some of the cash flow management things that you need to be thinking about, not taking on a lot of expenses on behalf of your clients that you're waiting to get reimbursed for. I've seen this with a number of agencies who have uh, fronted um, online ad spending and things like that. That's always almost uniformly a bad idea. Don't do it. If you have substantial expenses, either get the client to front you the cash so that you can then uh, make the ad buys or um, the investments on their behalf or just have them uh, pay directly. In, in most cases, um, both of those options are feasible, so you just need to work out which one is um, the more prudent in your particular case. But really, 
as an agency, you can't become a bank for your clients any more than you already are. Many of you are already allowing your clients to have far too long to, to pay, and I get it, particularly when you're dealing with large companies, they're going to refuse to pay except on their own timeline, so there are limits to what you can and can't do. Uh, but I think you need to really be uh, thoughtful about the expenses you're making. So I think this is a, a great point that um, Art is making. So a uh, worthwhile article. Um, go over to O'Dwyer PR to, to read it for yourself and, and take a, a deeper look at some of the issues that, that Art is raising. Um, uh, next article that, that came across my desk that I thought was worth looking at is starting to look to the future. So now we've We've looked at some of the bad things that are happening, some of the lessons that, that we can take away from it. Um, but now let's take a look ahead and start to think about, you know, what is the agency of the future going to look like? Because I am certainly in the camp that believes that what we're experiencing right now is going to have a long-term impact. It's going to make changes to how agencies operate. It's going to change the agency-client relationship for a good point into the future. And I think that agencies that are uh, thinking about it and trying to figure out how to innovate on uh, behalf of their clients, innovate their service models, uh, I think there is a lot of opportunity to be had here. And so as we take a look at um, this particular piece um, from uh, Kimberly Eberl uh, of Motion, uh, and this is on the uh, PR News website. Uh, again, uh, recommend you go over there and take a look at it. But there are three particular things that Kimberly is identifying here um, that are worth looking at. And so the first one is reliance on project work. Frankly, this is something that I think we've already been seeing a trend toward in the broader uh, agency space in recent years, movement away from um, open-ended retainers and more of a focus on project work. As I've said on the Agency Leadership Podcast and elsewhere, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. It certainly requires a change in mindset for many agencies to think about how it is that they are interacting with um, their clients, uh, to think about how they're structuring their business deals. When you're doing things on a project basis, you need to really make sure that you're nailing pricing correctly. And we'll talk a little bit more about pricing um, in a moment. In the retainer space, you can sort of, there, there's uh, a little bit more forgiveness uh, if you price uh, at a, a higher level to, to make the adjustments that you need on a project by project basis. But if you're selling individual projects to clients, you really need to get it right because if someone pays uh, X dollars for a widget, they're not going to decide to pay 2x uh, at some point down the road when you realize that you've mispriced it. They're going to expect that that widget is roughly um, x dollars every time they want it. So uh, it requires a change in mindset. It requires a change in budgeting, a change in pricing. Uh, but I certainly think that uh, Kimberly is right. and We are going to see accelerated movement uh, into project-based work between agencies and clients. Uh, second point that Kimberly raises here is agility. Absolutely, we're going to see a whole lot more uh, demand for agility, and this is agility in a lot of different ways. Um, so agility comes in the form of taking a look at uh, how the agencies are working internally. It has to do with how they're working with clients. Um, I think that in particular, uh, one of the things that I've seen are that agencies that are uh, much more of a hybrid between employee and contractor model tend to be being a bit more resilient in these times because they have the flexibility to to add and remove resources on the contractor side a bit more easily, um, and it's it's more easily not just uh, typically from you know a, a contract in dollars and cents standpoint, but it tends to be easier for most agency owners to make those adjustments to independent contractors as opposed to employees just from that psychological human element. And so, you know, obviously, we've talked in the past about independent contractors being a challenging environment generally these days, uh, particularly with AB5 in California and some of the more stringent regulations in states like New York um, and states generally cracking down on definitions of independent contractors. But I think one of the things that we will see coming out of this crisis, depending upon how public policy shifts, is more of that hybrid mix 
uh, for agencies between the employee model and the contractor model uh, because you do need to have that agility. You need to also be agile though in terms of how you're working with your clients and you need to be flexible and creative in coming up with the arrangements whether that's thinking about projects, whether that's thinking about different pricing and payment terms. There's a lot of things that agencies can do to, um, to be more flexible and to be more creative um, in the solutions that they're delivering. So I absolutely agree that agility is something to focus on. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, the, the contract side of things, we talked about that uh, with regard to uh, Arts Piece. Kimberly is also uh, advocating for tougher contract terms. Uh, you know, as I said before, I, I think that it's, it's fine to have fairly strong contract terms, but understand that it's very difficult to enforce and usually it's not worthwhile uh, financially to enforce it. So you need to figure out um, how you use these contracts as leverage in your discussions as opposed to, um, you know, hard and fast things that you're using to, to make uh, your clients do certain things. Um, so let's, again, looking towards the future, I saw this interesting piece that Carl Sakis wrote. Um, and Carl's an agency consultant who focuses a lot on the, the digital agency space. Uh, and one of the things that he has tried to do in his recent article um, at his website, sakisandcompany.com, is to take a look at how you can try to forecast your own revenue as an agency right now. And it, it's very challenging. I, I've talked with a number of agency owners, and, and actually I was talking with one yesterday, and we were joking. We talked, I think, at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and she said, well, this is, this is how I see things at 3 o'clock on May 14th. And I said, uh, well, check back at 4, right? And she said, no, well, how about 3.15? You know, the, the, the predictions may be different even 15 minutes uh, from now. You just don't know what you're going to see is the, the next breaking news crawl on CNN or the next AP news bulletin that you get in your email. So things are changing rapidly, and it is difficult to make predictions. But I think Carl has done a nice job of looking at a framework that you can use um, when you're looking at the, the business to try to at least start to make some projections. And what he really smartly does is he encourages you to look at your clients and their revenues. So you almost in some ways are becoming a business analyst um, and taking a look at your clients to try to predict what's going to happen to them. When are they going to start seeing demand or when are they going to be in a position to start generating demand? And as an agency, that's where we can come in and help, but we need to sort of figure out where that inflection point is. Obviously, if you're in a fine dining restaurant and you're an agency working for the fine dining restaurant, now probably isn't the time that they're going to be looking to do demand generation because there isn't a whole lot of call for sitting down at a white tablecloth, high ticket uh, meal. They're not the kinds of places that you want to go to if you're smelling disinfectant all over the place and you're seated uh, eight or ten feet away from the next table and actually I saw that the in at Little Washington just out of uh, outside of DC is apparently going to be putting mannequins at some tables. I interesting concept, maybe creepy concept, I'm not really sure but uh, you know it's still I'm, I'm not sure that that's the the place where if you're an agency you're going to be predicting that their revenue and and need for demand generation is going to come back so therefore your own uh, business is going to come back in that space soon. Um, so you need to try to become that business analyst where you take a look and try to figure out what you can. And this, frankly, is one of those areas where it's really helpful if you are in a niche. If you have figured out one or two or maybe three verticals that you're focused on because you'll start to know and understand it better. And that's, that's really one of the benefits of coming up with a niche approach to your agency. It's not just that it makes your, your marketing more narrow. It really is that it helps build your expertise, build your team's expertise. And so if you are an expert in healthcare or technology or SaaS or whatever, you are in a better position to help figure out what it is likely to be happening to, with your client's revenue. That said, there's no replacement for actually talking to your clients and your prospects. Ask them, what are they seeing? What are they expecting? And I think really as an agency owner, as an agency leader, it is incumbent upon you to spend more time than usual right now having these conversations. 
even if you're not typically involved in the day-to-day -day with an individual client, now is the time to pick up the phone, schedule a call, talk to the key people at your, your client's organization, understand what are the stresses that they're feeling, what are the opportunities that they're seeing. You need to be able to to work within this framework that Carl is talking about to try to make some predictions about what kind of revenue situation your clients are going to have to help inform your own revenue projections. And Carl does a really nice job walking through in his piece much more uh, detailed uh, steps that you can take to look at uh, at demand and try to, to put them into categories. So you don't necessarily need to become a full-on business analyst, but you do need to, to have a good, strong understanding um, of the overall business space for your clients to start making some of these predictions. Um, the next piece that I saw that I thought uh, was, was worth bringing to your attention uh, is related to internships. And this is a conversation I've had with several agency owners recently. Um, this particular piece that uh, I saw on uh, Agility's website was talking about um, how uh, folks who are interested in getting into communication space should start with an internship at a PR agency. Uh, and as someone who got my start through an internship on Capitol Hill uh, nearly 30 years ago now, uh, I certainly am a huge believer in the power of internships, the value that they can provide uh, both to the individual and to the employer. Um, at the same time, I think we are in a tricky environment when it comes to internships. So I think that there is um, a, a need to have some degree of realism here. And so while I certainly think from the standpoint of a recent graduate or someone who's looking to get into PR, they ought to be looking at internships. And I know I've seen a number of pieces talking about agencies going to virtual internships. And I've, I've talked with some agency owners about potentially creating virtual internship programs. Uh, and I know that some who have uh, had had scheduled summer internships, they've tried to, to move those folks into a virtual role. And I think that's admirable I, because, you know, one of the things that we want to do as a broader agency community is to bring more young people into the fold, bring new people in, new blood, new thinking, and internships are a good way to do that. At the same time, I think we need to be careful because there is a tendency to think about interns as free or inexpensive labor. And if you're in a position as an agency where you've had to shed some staff uh, you know, to try to save costs, you might be thinking to yourself, well, maybe I can fill some of those gaps with, with interns. Uh, a couple of caveats here. The first one is you've got to be really careful about using interns as unpaid labor. That used to be common. Certainly, I know my first internship was completely unpaid, and I gave lots of great free labor to my employer back then, if I do say so myself. Uh, but you know, now it's much more challenging to do those. If you're going to do unpaid internships, you typically need to be doing it in conjunction with um, uh, an institute of, of higher education, and, and it has to be part of uh, an actual learning program. Um, if, if not, then you are typically in a position where you have to pay at least minimum wage. Um, so, you know, is, is that cheaper than a regular employee? Yes, of course. But I think you what gets missed a lot is whether you're paying someone nothing or next to nothing as an intern, you still have to invest a lot. And it's not necessarily in direct cash outlays, but it's in terms of the actual management. I mean, think about it. If you, if you hire a new full-time employee, you don't expect them to be up to speed and fully servicing clients the next day. It's going to take them some time. If you've got an intern who is part-time or maybe over the summer full-time, uh, you know, you, you, you still can't expect them to hit the ground running, um, and it's going to take them some time to learn. And most internships, you know, maybe they're 8, 10, 12 weeks tops. That's, a, that's not a lot of time to get them uh, both trained up and productive. And you have to keep in mind that these are folks who, in many cases, haven't even had an office job before, let alone have done the specific kind of work that you're asking them to do. So I think it's really important to have a bit of a reality check on the role that interns can play, particularly now in the virtual space. It's a whole lot harder to integrate an intern into your business um, in a virtual way if you've never done that before. So my advice generally to agencies right now is that 
it, it's probably best to hit pause on virtual interns unless it's something that you have a real experience with doing. And even if you do it, you have to have realistic expectations that it's going to be as much or more of a learning experience for them as it is uh, an additive value to your um, work and productivity needs. So um, in any case, uh, the, the final topic that I wanted to touch on today is pricing. And pricing is something that has come up it came up in the PRSA uh, discussion members discussion forum earlier this week. It's something I've talked with a couple of clients about recently, and it's just it's an ongoing issue for agencies. And I'll I'll do a separate video on this, but I, I did want to say a couple of things, particularly in this time in looking at pricing. The first and most important thing I would say is it's really vital that you don't negotiate against yourself. If you are in a situation where you're saying, "God, I, I know my clients are feeling pressure." I need to proactively look for ways to reduce their expenses before they come to me. Most of the time, that's not a great idea, it, particularly if you haven't had any conversation with a client that's had any indication that they are not feeling like they're getting value or that they feel like they don't have the budget. You really need to be in a position where you feel confident in the value that you're delivering for the prices that you're charging. So. Um, start with pricing for the existing client base. You should assume, unless you know otherwise or believe otherwise, that the value is sufficient for the client to feel good about what they are paying. And so you shouldn't be going and saying, okay, let me figure out how I can give you a cheaper option. It's absolutely worth, as I said before, having conversations with your clients to try to figure out what's going on in their business. And if you detect that they are inclined to reduce spending or inclined to have a need to reduce spending, fine, have that conversation. Figure out how you can make adjustments. Now, if you do reduce pricing, you always need to reduce your service levels. It may even only be symbolic, but you can't be in a position where you're charging $5,000 today and you charge $4,000 tomorrow and there's no change whatsoever into uh, any other terms because all that says to a client is that they were effectively being overcharged at the $5,000 rate. So if you were going to make a reduction of any kind, you need to either uh, reduce the, the services that you're offering, reduce the quantity, uh, increase the turnaround time, change the payment terms maybe from 30 days after to up front. That you, you, there, are, there are a variety of things that you can adjust so that the client understands that there is a relationship between what they pay and what they have to provide, uh, what, what you're providing. And so be creative, find different ways to do it, but never just do a straight price reduction with no other change to the, the overall agreement. But now let's look at, at prospects. And right now there is a tendency, I think, for agencies to grasp for any revenue and to be concerned about whether clients can afford their services in these times. And that's absolutely legitimate. I've said on the podcast and a few other places recently that you do need to be take, keeping in mind that there is a substantial uh, decrease in demand. There will soon be an increase in supply as new agencies get created, as there are more freelancers available who have been laid off either from agencies or big brands, and that's going to be putting pressure on the, the supply side. And so supply and demand still plays a role here. So you are going to need to look at your overall pricing and value and all that. Um, but what I would say is don't just assume that you need to reduce prices. Instead, you need to come up with a rational pricing model, which starts with a budget. And I know, and, and this is something I harp on a lot, it's so important in an agency, no matter whether you're building websites or doing PR or advertising or whatever, you need to have very clear project budgets, client budgets that you use internally, that you're putting together at the prospect stage based on your estimates of what it will take to accomplish the work that you are promising to that client. And you need to make sure that you've got a budget in place because that budget will tell you what your, your staff costs are going to be, what your out-of-pocket expenses might be for software services, subscriptions, whatever. Once you have that number, you can then figure out what the floor is. What's the price that you simply cannot go below 
for that work in order for it to be profitable. And as a general rule of thumb, if you take your actual hard costs, staff, and out-of-pocket expenses um, for a project and double it. So let's say my total cost is going to be $10,000, so that means my price floor should be $20,000. Now you need to work out these numbers specific to your agency, but if you're looking for a quick back-of-the-napkin rule of thumb, that doubling is, is probably going to be a good floor that will keep you out of trouble. But now if you're at that $20,000 number, you need to figure out how much more can I go above that? How, how can I tell the story of the value that I'm providing? How can I show the prospect or the client what they're going to be getting for it that's going to make it worth 30, 35,000, something like that? Whatever the number is that you can get to. Uh, but you also need to do a market reality check and understand what does the market bear? What is, what is it set up for right now? What is, uh, what is called for from a pricing perspective? So if you take a look at all of those factors, you know your floor, then you can start figuring out how high up that ladder you can go in showing the value and being able to charge for it. Uh, but by all means, try to, to A, make sure that you are not charging too little. If you do that, you're going to get in trouble. And I don't care. I, I know I've talked with a lot of folks. I've been in organizations that have tried to underprice initial projects with clients just to get in the door saying, all we got to do is get a foothold and we'll show them how good we are and, and grow from there. It doesn't work, my friends. It just does not work. If you are underpricing that first project, that first retainer, whatever it is for a client, you're not going to be able to get them up to the proper level because they're going to become accustomed to paying that lower price. You're never going to go into Walmart and start buying premium products. You're always going to go to Walmart for the lowest price because that's how they sell themselves. And it works really well. And if you want to be the agency that sells at the lowest price, great. There's probably a place for you, but you can't delude yourself into thinking that you start at lowest price and then are able to move up from there. It just it does not work within an individual client. You certainly can look at pricing differently for other clients down the road, but never convince yourself that you can make climb that ladder with an individual client. It simply doesn't work. Um, so you need to make sure that you're not underpricing, but then you also need to be um, focused on pricing competitively. And if you do that, you'll find that happy equilibrium where you've got the right pricing model. So start with a budget, know what your floor is, take a look at the market, figure out what it'll bear, figure out what you can show as value, and then you'll be able to settle on a fair price. And of course, you get better with this over time. And some of the things to look for when you're talking about getting good pricing uh, is to make sure that as you listen to clients in the prospect stage, if you throw out prices and nobody ever pushes back, try to push a little bit higher with the next prospect. If, you, if you're not getting pushback on pricing, you're probably not charging enough. If you're getting pushback all the time, then you're probably charging too much and you want to try to find a happier space. If everybody walks away because you're too expensive, then you need to look at, is your pricing wrong? Or I mean, it's possible that your expense model is wrong. It's costing you too much to deliver. It's possible that you're not doing a good job of expressing what the value is that you're delivering. And we all need to be thinking about that in the agency space because if you really want to maximize the price that you're getting, the revenue that you're generating, it's all about the value that you're creating. And particularly in a challenging time like this, you need to be thinking even more carefully about how to portray the value of your services. You need to be thinking about regular updates to your retainer clients that are not just showing outputs, but really are showing the value. And we know it's challenging because I've, I've spent a long time in the measurement space. I know that it's very difficult to get access to a lot of the internal client metrics that would really help you understand sales and revenue and talk about the, the impact that you're having on those uh, figures. But you need to do the best that you can because if you're not communicating that value, if you're not showing exactly what it is that you can do, particularly right now, you're going to be putting your existing client work at jeopardy and you're going to be making it more difficult to generate the additional revenue that you uh, would like to earn and that, frankly, you probably deserve. So um, with that, that's going to wrap up um, this Free For All Friday. I've covered a lot of ground here. Hopefully, uh, some of the articles that I've shared and some of the thoughts that uh, I've discussed here with you will be useful to you as you continue to find ways to grow your own agency business, uh, both today and in the future. Um, I look forward to continued 
uh, discussions uh, here with all of you. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can always email chip at agencyleadership.com. I'm happy to have a conversation. Hop on the phone with anybody who's interested. Uh, if you've got topics that you'd like to see me cover in future videos or articles or on the podcast, wherever, feel free. Just drop me a note. I'm always happy to hear from you and love to hear uh, that there are actual listeners and viewers out there. So, with that, have a great weekend, and thank you for your time.